Hello, um, welcome to our latest conversation as part of the COVID Western Balkans Dialogue. I'm very glad to speak today to Gentio Lamati, who is uh, an analyst, consultant following events and developments in Albania, Kosovo, uh, and across the region. And we're talking about um, Albania today. So welcome to our conversation. Thank you for finding the time. Um, so so um, tell me a little bit, how do you see uh, what has been the kind of government response? I mean, we, we see in Albania, just like in other countries, the response of the government has been fairly uh, heavy handed, you would, uh, I would say. Would you also see that? How do you, how do you assess the, the government response to, to COVID-19 um, over the last couple of weeks, months now? Yes, uh, basically Albania in general, being me, myself now uh, based in, in Italy for the moment, for the, uh, the lockdown, Albania is perceived as a continuation sometimes of Italy. We, we generally refer also to uh, going to Albania, it's like going down as you go to Sicily. So you know, initially it was expected with this long, uh, long tradition and strong exchanges that are among the, the two countries, we expected Albania or at least the government to take some measures, preventive measures, earlier than uh, the identification of the case itself, the first case on the 9th, 10th of March. But um, initially the government was kind of reluctant. Uh, they opted for continuing the, the flight uh, every day. There are at least 75, 17 flights from Italy to Albania and vice versa. So um, there were no measures. There, were, there was one reaction from a, a private school education which decided to go uh, online and the ministry took quite a hard decision in that regard. So that was the first precedent that the people started realizing that the virus is not so far. It's not in China, it's in our border in Italy with our relatives uh, living there. The government, uh, on, in following the Italian decision on the 9th of March, the Albanian government did the same thing. They decided to have uh, quite a strong uh, approach to the uh, to the virus, they were pretty much aware that the situation uh, of the healthcare system in Albania was not able to afford such uh, uh, a similitude as it happened in Italy. So uh, they opted for uh, hard measures, the curve. Uh, but at the same time, it was also difficult for the citizens to follow all these uh, modifications day by day of the legislation. When I mean legislation, not in, in a written form, but orders issued by the, by the prime minister and the respective ministers uh, to uh, go out for shopping, to go out to work, who can go out, who can open up the, the businesses, which is the primary uh, services that the, the people need, and mostly fooding. We should be well aware and remember that in 97, Albania passed another difficult situation with uh, uh, emergency state and people have some remembrance of that moment. So even though I wouldn't draw a, a comparison uh, uh, rightly on that, but there is some reminiscence in there. So the changes of the legislation, the, the, the orders day by day created some kind of confusion, but on the same time re made people realize that we are in this together, so uh, we should definitely um, protect ourselves. And since we cannot trust the government, because we know that the government cannot do that, uh, cannot provide the services that are needed, so uh, let's do a step back and try to avoid doing regrouping outside and stay at home. But uh, on the other side, uh, the, the measures that the government uh, took um, on COVID showed also um, a focalization or a personalization of power. Having uh, mostly uh, the prime minister talking to the nation, having prime minister writing on Facebook, on the social media, um, preparing uh, the, the materials for the, for the journalists, which brought on the other uh, side also some kind of tricky because it even more undermined the trust of the people. It's um, sometimes you question like, don't we have any other experts on health issues or did they all left in Germany to Germany and other EU countries because of uh, better working conditions? So uh, this was pretty much um, the, the, the general approach. But on the other side, what uh, I would distinguish in the Albanian case with respect to uh, Italy or, or other EU countries is uh, the lack 
of surveillance of the, from the government to the citizens. And this is not because the government didn't want it, this is um, at least my position, but because they don't have technological means and the necessary infrastructure to control the people. And in this, being aware of this situation, they opted for bringing into the streets the armed car, like the, 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 um, the Ministry of um, Defense, uh, uh, troops, uh, which sometimes seems also a bit weird and worrisome and creating also panic because um, it's not that the, the army is going to protect the people from the enemy. And we are, I think that we are not in a war, but we should be well aware that it is a, a, a specific situation that we are all together and we should protect each other, protecting oneself and at the same time protecting the other by putting the mask and so on and so forth. And the last thing that I would um, mention, which is um, worrisome, uh, is the fact that at the end of March, the Albanian government decided to, uh, to suspend some articles of the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights. This is uh, something normal that other governments do, but um, just looking through the names of the countries that did the same thing, it was not done by, um, let's say, EU uh, member states or neighbors in the region. So uh, I don't see, uh, at least uh, my perspective, I don't see the reason why the government had to push so far. And this suspension of, of certain rights go, goes until uh, the end of June, when the state of emergency will be um, will be suspended or will be lifted, which creates also problems and, and difficulties because it might be uh, used, this opportunity might be used by the governments or other institutions for certain purposes that allows them to uh, strengthen their power uh, uh, and um, create, let's say, unnecessary harm and unnecessary structures that might be permanent. And one of these examples is the modification in uh, April of the criminal code. It was done in such a, a fast way, uh, without proper consultations in a short time. And we should be aware that uh, those norms that, that, uh, that were included in the, um, in the criminal code will be there, will remain there after uh, the 21st of June. So, so um, maybe you can tell us, I mean, there are a couple of things you've raised, uh, which I would like to pick up on, but one is, is uh, the criminal code. So what, what is it about and what is the kind of implications of that change? Yeah, well, initially uh, the government decided to, uh, because it was not mentioned in the criminal code, um, the, the crime or the intention to do harm to people, just because you, you, uh, you have the symptoms of uh, the, um, the, the virus or you're asymptomatic, in order to prevent this, uh, this spread of the, uh, of the virus, the government proposed to modify uh, the code. Uh, introducing 15 years of imprisonment for um, for this mass dis um, and um, the th almost 30 uh, NGOs uh, with the Helsinki committee they uh, started advocating and they started their uh, campaign uh, saying that basically it's not proportional the me the measures are not consistent in the nature and the proportionality goes beyond the the, the, the idea. I can give an example if I'm not wrong. It, uh, you can have, uh, you can be condemned to seven up to eight years if you spread the HIV virus. Well, here we were about 15, min uh, 15 years. So uh, after the, um, this feedback from the, from the civil society sector and as experts, the government decided then to reduce it. But however, those seven years or eight years are there and so you can uh, you can risk to to be um, to be put in jail for for so long just for this purpose, and we should be aware that for as long as the government doesn't do um, proper testing, I mean uh, the numbers are still uh, the testing is really uh, low. For as long as they do do not do this mass testing, then how can the people know that they are asymptomatic? We should also consider that not all the population is well informed, not well educated. We have people living in different rural areas where sometimes they don't have, even have electricity. How can they follow the updates on Facebook? Mm -hmm. So, because Facebook was the, the first instrument used by uh, the prime minister in order to, um, to make known to the people that the, the rules are changing. 
I mean, the other point which you've mentioned um, is is uh, this kind of centralization or this kind of very that everything is centered around the role of the central role of the prime minister. Um, so, I mean, of course, would you would you also see that this is basically reinforcing pre-existing trends? I mean, this is nothing new that power has been centralized very much around the prime minister in Albania. Do you see this kind of accelerated or or worsened by the by by the crisis? If I interpret you right. Yes, uh, it is the first uh, uh, the first option that you you said. Basically, acceleration. Unfortunately, Albania has been uh, embarked in this difficult institutional and political crisis that started after the elections of 2017, where the opposition uh, accuses the government of uh, um, corruptive affairs and uh, fraud in, in, in elections during uh, that year. So uh, last year, in February, the, the opposition decided to rel relinquish the mandates. And uh, while on the side of the opposition, this might have been, let's say, a Russian roulette or uh, a shot that they probably they didn't even assess uh, the, the, the consequences afterwards, or at least they didn't expect to have such a situation or recognition of the power of the government on the other side, they provided uh, the freedom to the government to do whatever uh, they want to, in the sense that for as long as you have a parliament where uh, the members of the opposition have been uh, destituted or changed with new people that are not experts, let's say, or are not representatives, the parliament in the last year has become gener generating uh, just laws. No uh, effective uh, role on the monitoring of the government, no inquiries, no commission just to monitor what is happening with COVID, just a specialized commission dealing just with this, this specific situation. So uh, the, the parliament has become weak. On the other side, we have this justice reform, which for one reason or, yeah, or another is it's prolongating its course. It has not given yet the, the, the expected results, maybe sometimes more is needed, but on, on, the, same, on the other side, this justice reform has paralyzed the, the, the institutions. And here, I would mention the Constitutional Court and the High, and the high, high Court. Especially the Constitutional Court is, um, has just one, one member. And for as long as the Constitutional Court cannot deliberate on many issues, then we create the opportunity uh, for the government to flourish, uh, its ideas or its way of, uh, of behaving towards a, a certain uh, specific situations, among which COVID uh, is one of them. The only institution that is not in line with the government at the moment is uh, the president of the Republic. But uh, on the other hand, the president has a specific role and the president has not been consistent enough in uh, his uh, public uh, behavior because it was the president uh, on the, at the beginning of March when we already knew that there were these problems with COVID uh, in the near border with Italy, the president decided to call for a manifestation against the government because they are uh, violating the constitution. And it is always the same president who signed uh, the, the law or approved the modification of uh, the criminal uh, code. So it's, it's, it's not trustful enough, let's say. And all the situation, including also the fact that the um, central government, the, the ruling party, uh, owns also all the municipalities, uh, that the municipality level is, uh, is run by the Socialist Party, then we have this triangle, which is just monocolor, I would say. Mm -hmm. it's so, an so, so basically, like this, the, with you saying the judiciary is, of course, because of the ongoing reform hampered, the parliament is not able to be critical, municipalities are not. So basically, we have no checks and balances at the moment, uh, functional in Albania. Uh, and the president, of course, neither has the constitutional power and probably has also his own legitimacy deficit, as one could uh, say. Um, to be really playing that function effectively. Um, is there, uh, so basically, even in this moment of crisis, this wasn't an opportunity to kind of bring the opposition into the dialogue over how to respond, or has the, has the opposition been kind of completely absent from the, uh, since the COVID-19 outbreak? Well, the opposition itself, it's quite fundamental, I would say. We have two oppositions. 
the opposition in the parliament, which are basically the persons that were ranked at the, at the very end of the lists of the MPs during the, the elections that decided not to align themselves with the party and accept the mandate to, uh, to become uh, MPs. And then uh, we have the other opposition, the one outside, which is a traditional uh, democratic party and the socialist movement for integration. Uh, while the, the parliamentary opposition is quite uh, um, silent, I would say, it's not vocal, they don't have quite a strong leadership. Uh, and the, the other opposition uh, is, is vocal, I cannot say that is not uh, silent, but the way how they approach uh, the, the government and knowing, uh, other, um, uh, knowing before that this, uh, this political party or this opposition has not the necessary trust among the citizens because they decided to play this card of leaving the parliament, there is not enough credibility. They basically have stated that the government should do more to assist uh, the businesses, the families in need, to take measures, but they do not elaborate cl clearly enough where are these money coming from. Because obviously you want to do something you propose, but you should think also of uh, how to arrange and how to materialize what you're proposing. On the other side, uh, they also decided or they also expressed their will to do more um, uh, testing of the population. We know that the World Health Organization has provided to Albania 20,000 tests. Up to now, we are uh, less than 10,000 tests done to the public. So it's, it's nonsense for as long as we to have this uh, test available, or at least this is what is, has been declared. Let's try and reach out. Obviously, on one side, we know that Albania is a small country and it's easy to, to detect the family members of a person that has, has been uh, suffering of the virus. But on the other hand, it would be good also to identify the asymptomatic for as long as we don't have a clear vision of the virus and how it spreads and all, which are all the, uh, the elements that uh, the, the virus brings with himself or itself. Um, another thing I want to pick up on, I mean, you mentioned, of course, the close links to Italy um, through migration, um, between Albania. And what I, what I found striking in the response, if you look at Serbia, the government and the president very explicitly blamed uh, its Serb diaspora for coming back to the country and bringing in the virus. So it was in a certain way, um, kind of became the scapegoat um, of spreading the disease. I'm now just wondering how has the migrants, probably many migrants also returned to, from Italy to Albania as a result of the, the crisis. How have they been received? Has there been a similar rhetoric or were they, were they welcomed more or less or how was their, their reception back in Albania when they returned? Well, I would start by saying that we have a specific expression in Albanian uh, that says uh, going living grain for hail. So uh, I don't know to what extent the Albanians living in, uh, in Italy would leave uh, the country despite the, 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 uh, the pandemic, but at least you know that there, is a, um, there are functional hospitals to go to Albania and take on the risks. Uh, oh, this is one side. On the other side, I would say that there is, uh, there was no rhetoric on uh, from the side of the government with res uh, with respect to the diaspora. They have never been accused or endorsed any kind of uh, similar responsibilities. But on the other side, the diaspora here is also the one that contributes to the economy. We should be well aware that a, a certain percentage uh, of the Albanian uh, income comes from, from the diaspora and the family links that we do have there. And then this uh, vicinity or this closeness with Italy has, um, has blurred up a bit the, this differentiation between Italy and Albania, probably because now we are the second generation of citizens here. So in a way or in another has helped also the, the, the Albanian country to become much more uh, open or at least uh, much more different from what it was when it was closed uh, under the dictatorship. Uh, I positively assessed uh, the, the initiative of the Prime Minister to bring uh, some uh, medical staff here during the month of April. Uh, it, there were around 30 persons among doctors and nurses that served on the front line uh, in Bergamo and uh, Brescia hospitals, which on the other side it is good because it showed 
uh, also to our uh, medical staff to understand that sometimes going abroad is not as you expected, that there are the same challenges, and then we can learn from each other through this experience, specific one, but also the follow-ups uh, afterwards in order to build a system in Albania and also to have this exchange for as long as the Albanians now have the Italian citizenship and votes in both countries. So it's quite a win-win situation at a certain point. But of course, the other problem, I don't know how much this has uh, become a topic of concern in Albania, is that uh, because you know the economic downturn is going to be very harsh in a country like Italy as a result of the, 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 the pandemic, uh, as well as Greece, I mean, two big countries which have large Albanian uh, diasporas, um, that the economic impact on Albania is uh, probably also going to be very large because remittances will probably be less because many have probably lost their jobs, will have much less income. Um, so is this something which is being discussed as, a, as an important topic uh, for uh, the kind of prospects for Albania? Well, uh, personally, I'm not an economist, but I would say that definitely uh, it will be a problem. Uh, it will be quite a serious problem. And uh, considering that we had also the earthquake, so the situation is going to be a double, uh, a double crisis. Uh, having uh, around 25% of the GDP coming from the tourism, it's, uh, it's quite a harm for as long as uh, the, the borders are closed or for as long as the Albanians at least living in Italy cannot go to Albania because they have these 14 days of quarantine. The, the vacations then generally are two weeks. So the situation is going to be quite problematic in Albania. I'm quite uh, worried about that. And uh, another thing is that the fact that over the years we have invested, or at least the government has invested a lot in public-private partnerships, in concessions, bids, uh, this will create problems because we will have to, uh, to pay a lot uh, to uh, the public partnership agreements on the one side. We have a lot of loans taken in order to rebuild the, the earthquake-destroyed areas, so it is going to be quite problematic. and. I'm really worried to know, uh, worried and would like to know how the government intends to uh, address this issue, while at the same time fighting corruption, fulfilling the uh, EU uh, requirements in order to open up the negotiations and not having a, a justice system, because we are talking uh, about the bulk a state that doesn't have a functional rule of law, cannot have a performing economy, uh, investments, and so on and so forth, for as long as you cannot fight corruption. You have the people uh, brought in front of the court, and then they are judged because of this uh, non-legal non agreements with uh, who is taking the decision. So mm. uh, it's going to be problematic, and the most, uh, the, the, the most vulnerable uh, part of the of the society are basically uh, the elderly people and also women uh, in specific situations with kids uh, without a work or violence in, in the family. So uh, it becomes quite problematic because we should be aware that Tirana doesn't re um, respect or doesn't reflect all Albania. Realities are quite different in the smaller cities. Um let me ask you also, because of course Albania is one of the two countries which got the green light uh, during the pandemic in the beginning, uh, for beginning of accession talks. How much is this, I mean, you mentioned it just now in your answer that, uh, of course, for the actual talks to begin, it requires a few more steps, so to speak. How, how is this signal, uh, which was taken uh, relatively early on in March, uh, viewed in Albania? Is this seen as a, you know, finally a good news or is it kind of overshadowed by everything else which is ongoing? Well, this disappointment uh, because of the veto of France, Netherlands and, and Denmark uh, for three rounds in, in a row uh, led to quite a dis dis disillusionment mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in a way or in another coupled with uh, the Covid crisis in March, it uh, shadowed a bit the, the um, the achievement, if we can talk about achievement. On the side of the EU, this is a positive step, um, at least, for what, I, uh, what I've been uh, following so far. While on the side of the government, I don't see it uh, quite a clear vision on how to tackle the new conditions, because the new conditions might be interpreted, these 15 conditions might be interpreted also that we give you uh, um, a green light, but it, the duty is on you. You haven't done 
uh, your homeworks already before, otherwise you would have achieved the same uh, treatment as, uh, as North Macedonia. Moreover, uh, in foreign policy, uh, unfortunately, in the last one year and a half, uh, I think that we haven't performed as well as before. We should mention that in foreign policy, uh, the Albanian political parties are, uh, agree with, among each other. We have always the same line and the, the same Euro-Atlantic aspirations. So there are no uh, extremist party challenging or at least disputing the, the EU credibility. But is on the, the internal side, not having at least at the moment a proper minister of foreign affairs that follows the agenda and advocates uh, on an equal basis with his uh, uh, colleagues at the EU level, or at least also gives um, public speeches and, and, and ensures the citizens that we are doing something. Because uh, as, as it is already known, the prime minister, because of this um, disagreement with, uh, with the president, is officially the, the minister of foreign affairs. There is an acting minister uh, on the one side for the foreign affairs, but on the, uh, since we have also the presidency of the OSCE for the moment, uh, it is the prime minister who uh, attends and chairs the meetings, or in, in the case when he cannot attend, we have the special representative, which is not obviously the, the, the minister, uh, the, the acting minister. So this, in a specific field, which is priority for, a priority for Albania, and it's a, a long-term investment, not having a, a political figure uh, well-prepared and that can ensure, can inform, can raise awareness, uh, and also advocate and push the colleagues to, to do more, uh, unfortunately, it brings to the situation that we cannot expect a lot. I mean, not just in, during 2019, but I would question also uh, June of next year, are we uh, well prepared and can we achieve as much as requested by the EU uh, and its member state in order to have the accession negotiations mm -hmm. opened effectively with the first intergovernmental uh, conference and uh, today it's the it is the summit of Zagreb it happened that uh, we are in the middle of this pandemic but otherwise uh, we didn't even have much time in order to implement the homework from March to now so it would have been just more a presence than a, a real contribution to show that Albania is really committed and it's doing the hard and uh, hard work mm -hmm. because now the countries and the political steering itself uh, in the, with the new uh, methodology, expect much more from Albania. It cannot go uh, with this um, with this speed. The pace should mm. be uh, really uh, increased, and results should be delivered. Mm -hmm. well, we are putting it personal credibility, basically. Right. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks again, Tiola. I would ask you maybe in conclusion a question. I ask all my my my. Uh, uh, partners in conversation is how has this whole pandemic affected your work life? I've talked to mayors, I've talked to think tank analysts and academics. So how does it look like, you know, as a researcher, as a consultant, how has this uh, affected your professional life? Uh, yeah, um, at the moment, I would say that it was a three phases uh, experience. Initially, when I declared during February, I declared the Italian residence I perceived the behavior of the uh, partners where I had to, to travel to uh, as, oh, you're Italian, you cannot attend. Although I, I have the Albanian passport, but at that moment, I thought that it was easier to travel with Italian documents. We cannot uh, you cannot attend because uh, you, you're coming from a uh, from Veneto region, which is, uh, is experiencing the, the COVID. So I tried to rethink about, is this discrimination? Am I put in front of non, an unequal uh, situation with regards to the other colleagues? Should I have this declared the, 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 Italian, the Albanian residents? Then it came the second phase, uh, in the beginning of March. It was um, the cost of a situation, I would say, that um, I had the document to travel, but I couldn't travel. And I thought about my colleagues in Kosovo. Sometimes they get the visa, but sometimes they cannot. They have the knowledge, but they cannot travel because of the visa liberalization and the behavior of some sort of member state. And then uh, the third phase that came shortly after was we are all together in the same experience. We appreciate more the human relations, understanding each other, 
uh, that the community, uh, the, the, as it has been shown also uh, in different uh, TV shows, the Italians do the, the parties on the balconies, discovering the, the new uh, elements that give you pleasure and, and enjoy in life. But in the longer run, it is uh, quite preoccupying. I don't know how it will uh, it will go. Doing research means that you have to travel, you have to go and do field works, meet the people, uh, discuss uh, at least in social sciences. And for as long as we don't have this exchange and the barriers are there, I don't know how how, how much harm uh, it will uh, it will affect and uh, how all the, the situation of promotion of democracy, pushing the governments, acting as as watchdogs mm. will uh, will cope together and influence the the future development. But obviously, hope is that uh, things will change uh, mm. in pretty pretty soon. Great. Kentiola, thank you so much for, for talking to me today. It was really a pleasure to hear your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Good luck.